This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. I have felt suicidal and I've won- I've plotted it all out in my mind what I would do when I would do it. Wait for my kids to go to sleep, you know, where I would go, what I would do. And it breaks my heart because then I look at them and I'm like, they don't deserve that. And then some of me says, Maybe they do deserve that because maybe they'd be better off without me because some days are a struggle for me. Um, caused so much problems, ruined my relationship, ruined my career. They ruined, you know, me as a person. I used to be have so much more confidence. You know, with all of this stuff, it kind of put a dampener on me. And it was just all the time, no matter where I was or what I did, they were there, you know, watching what I was doing, even when I'm not at work anymore. Yeah. Or the police like to brush it under the carpet. Because as I said to you earlier, there's so many real crazy, like real criminal things going on with cops murdering, you know, raping and all of this. The statistics that come out all the time of all the convictions of police officers. I saw things that cops were doing when I was in. It's very corrupt. Put it this way, I would rather go out and deal with, like walk through the streets of London on my own, you know, without my stab vest on and I'd feel safer than I was going to work with my own damn colleagues because I'd, I'd more likely get a knife in my back from them than I would out there and that's how sad it is. And boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Leanne Carr. Leanne, how are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, really well, thank yeah. you. First and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. Police officer to OnlyFans, but it's not as, as easy as I kind no. of jumped to that, even through a lot with the coppers and stuff, which we'll touch on later on in the interview. First and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. I always go back to the start of my guest, so get a wee bit of understanding about you, where you grew up, how it all began. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for having me, first of all. It's nice to meet you and to get this opportunity just to have my say on things. Um, so basically, I joined the police after being at university. I got a degree in criminology and forensic science, and I always wanted to be a scenes of crime officer, so it wasn't my plan to be in the police. But halfway through my degree, I realised that actual fact you didn't need a degree any longer to become a scenes of crime officer. So it kind of spent a lot of money on student debt and stuff like that and the pay for it then was become like an apprenticeship so you'd join and you'd be a scenes of crime officer trained on the job but I had this degree so I was like I don't want to have a low paid job and pay off my student debt forever. So I saw the police were recruiting, so I applied, and um, there was two roles. There was a call taker, so a call handler in the co force control room. What's that? So basically when someone rings the police, you, you have your emergency calls and your non-emergency calls. So I worked there, but I applied for both jobs at the same time, so the police and the call handler. And I was in my first week of my training of call handler when my police application was accepted. So I did for a whole year working in the control room. So 999 calls had come in and you'd basically take details onto a computer system and then the controllers would dispatch the cops to it. Um, so because of how long it takes for all the steps of recruitment to be a police officer, I did that for a whole year. So the experience I got from that was great because I saw the inside of the job. And obviously when I got into 
training and out on the streets I'd seen the other side of it so that was good um so yeah I started um in the police and um I had a good couple of years in the beginning um everyone was really great supportive I had like good sergeants good inspectors behind me and um I saw a lot of potential in me my my line managers and I went for what was called a high development scheme high potential development scheme HPDS it was called back then where it like fast track promotes you so I went through all of that because kind of was talent spotted you know she's got something and I went I went and did that and um, they said to me that I needed to go away and get some experience which it was supposed to be about potential so it didn't really make much sense but I was like you know what I'm not going to dampen my spirit so I, I sat my sergeant's exams you have to do two years pro uh, probation before you can be promoted or to put in to be promoted so I did my two years probation uh, was signed off as independent and all the rest and then I I went um, and did sat my sergeant's exam so there's different elements to it you have to do a written law exam and then you have to go to uh, Coventry you have to do scenario based stuff so there's maths and there's role play exercises and lots of different elements to it and then after you've done that you have a fitness test as well so there's lots of steps which is why I was in that control room for a whole year whilst that was so obviously after my two years um, I sat my sergeant's exams and um, I was promoted quite quickly. And that's when my problems started to happen in the police because I had a lot of people who were jealous. Um, a lot of cops come into it not as young. They come from other backgrounds, so they've done a little bit of military service or they come to it as a second job, so they've had, you know, a bit of life experience or whatever. And I think that was what the problem was. People didn't like me telling them what to do with my limited experience of policing having only two years. But, you know, I went through the same process that was for everyone. You know, you just sit your exams and if you're successful and you pass it, there's also a promotion board at the end of it. So you, you sit in front of a panel of HR and then two high ranking officers, I think deputy chief constable and, and whoever else they put on your panel. So there's lots of processes to go through uh, for, for the promotion. So it's... It, it's not like something that's given to you easily. You have to work your socks off for it. And this is what like has is, is upset me through the policing process. It's because of jealousy and bullying and harassment that I've ended up coming to where I am now and being in the place I am, which is not a very good place. Um, so that's when the, the problem started to happen. Um, <clears throat> people not being like to be told what to do. But, and I was like a decent, you know, a decent sergeant. I'd look after my staff. I saw a lot of, lot of things that were done terribly in the police, like bosses would, you know, use somebody as an example to get the next rank. You know, they felt the need that they need to discipline somebody to make an example of somebody to prove that they were capable of that rank. And I was never like that. I, I was supportive. I was really, uh, in my, my views, really good to my staff and looked after them. Um, so obviously there I was as a sergeant, I was struggling and, uh, with people kind of starting to tittle tattle, um, we have, or the police have in, in place a system that's supposed to be for corruption. So if, for example, you have, um, you're concerned about somebody being corrupt or somebody's doing something and you're too scared to speak up about it or to challenge that person, you can anonymous, anonymously submit a report. And that system in the force where I served was called Bad Apple. So basically you fill in a form and it goes off and it's supposed to be encrypted and all the identity of the, the author is taken away and it, it goes to professional standards who look at that and then they kind of assess it and decide what they're going to do with that information. Now in the police, that system was became obviously what caused me to be become unwell with my mental health and and uh, allowed for the bullying and harassment of me to go on so I was started to get lots and lots of these reports and they'd be really really pathetic silly things like oh Leanne's wearing pink nail varnish Leanne's just got a Porsche Leanne's modeling um now with my um my social media I enjoy my social media I enjoy traveling and my ex-partner um is good with photography and videography and um i went to the gym you know sometimes before i had children two three times a day i'd sometimes go worked hard to have a nice figure and to look nice and add nice pictures you know traveling in my annual leave um and obviously some of these reports were saying oh she's modeling so obviously professional standards picked on that and it was like oh you know what you need to submit a business interest for modeling and I'd be like I'm not modeling this is my personal social media it's my Instagram account um 
It's for my personal use. I don't get paid for it. I don't pay anyone to take the pictures of me. And this is where this started to really then, because I tried to stand up for myself with, uh, with professional standards, I think this is where it became a problem because it was like, you know what, back in your box, you know, we're telling you that you are modelling. And I'd be like, I'm not modelling. Now, this is where obviously the problems and the, the bad Apple reports were coming in all the time, all the time, all the time. And because of obviously my promotion, as soon as I got my sergeants, I sat my inspectors, which is your next rank up. Um, because it's a slightly higher pass rate on the, the law side of element of, of your... Um, you sit the same law exam, but you got to higher pass rate to be the inspector. And I thought, while the knowledge is fresh in my mind from sitting the sergeants, I'm going to sit the inspectors. So I did that and... Um, and passed and obviously people were seeing that and they, some of the bad apple reports were saying you know what she's having affairs in the police because obviously how is she getting these ranks um she's a golden girl she's got a silver spoon in the in her mouth you know she's got some sugar daddy in the police and it was just all really like pathetic nonsense which i expected you know maybe professional standards would step in and say you know enough's enough this isn't right um and with the the modeling side of it, obviously I still still was taking my pictures and posting them and they were like, Oh no, you can't do that. We've told you you're modeling. Um they they asked they made me submit a business interest for modeling in the end. So I did it and um and submitted it and of course they rejected it. They said, obviously, we don't approve this app this uh, this business interest application. I didn't really think much of it because I was like, you know what, you told me to do it. You're saying that um, you're not going to accept it. So it all seemed a silly process. But then what happened is the next thing, they, they um, served me papers for misconduct, for modelling, despite my business interest application being rejected. So I was... Um, See, when they've told you to, uh, to send away for <laughs> is that you basically admitting that you do that? But they've... Let's, so they've told you to send away for it. You've sent away from it. It's got rejected. But have they then got that there to say, well... Yeah, yeah, making money from this, so it's like a, a little setup. Yeah, that's almost what it felt like, like a setup. So basically, they're saying you're modelling. I said I'm not modelling. They said, well, you need to submit an application form to me saying. And you know, when in, when you're in the police and and it's police officers and high ranking police officers telling you to do something, you kind of feel obliged to. You don't have any protection. You have federation reps, and even now the federation reps are like, we don't, we're not comfortable. We don't think this is this is a, a business interest however just do it anyway so you do something and you submit it and they go well thanks for submitting your application to, to say that you're modeling but we're going to reject it so it was like a setup you know I did what they told me to do and then they rejected it so then the next thing is I've gone away on holiday somewhere and I've taken lots of, well, I've had lots of pictures taken and the really good ones and I'm posting them on my social media and they're like oh you've um You've gone against what's in your business interest. So now you're going to go through the misconduct process. So that involves me gathering evidence and sitting there in front of a panel of somebody independent and saying, actually, yeah, you're guilty of misconduct. So straight away, I've got this misconduct finding, which um, it's, qu it's quite a horrible process for police officers to go through that because it's stressful, you know. When they served me those papers, I was absolutely devastated. I had to take time off. It really affected my mental health, you know. I was like really, really hard working in the police and I, all I wanted to do was get my next rank. I'd passed the exams and I, I also had an injury with my shoulder, um, which I don't know if you've heard of method of entry. It's where you use a big red key um, oh, where you yeah, go yeah. and do warrants or drugs raids or whatever and you, you put the door in. Now, I, I did riot policing because I'm kind of one of these people that thinks, you know, I can do that, you know, you don't need to be big, tough and strong to do it. And uh, in policing, I kind of, I'm not a big person, but I used my, the way I speak to people a lot to get people to come around. I really loved like doing negotiations, you know, people who are feeling suicidal, people who need that help. I like talking to people and I think the mouth and the way that you speak to people is a far more powerful tool than using muscle. You know, I just, that's just my way of dealing with people. So I did the, the riot policing. And obviously I managed a busload of, of men, majority, because that's who do it. And we do things like, you know, um, protests. That's the kind of things that you go to in, in riot policing. You go to protests or you go to, you know, it, it could be like a big drugs bust or whatever else. And, and they're the kind of things, football as well. That's another thing where you get the, 
the PSU police support unit, they call them. So part of that, because I wanted to do that, they made me do the enforcer training with the big red key. And that's how I hurt my shoulder. So I had to spend a lot of time on restricted duties as well. You know, um, I was on medication and I'd, I have had two operations because I tore my bicep tendon. And I think people looked at me and they were like, you know, she's not having to work night shifts. You know, she's she's um, she's on the, she's on these these restricted hours. Um, and um, I think there was a lot of jealousy in that as well. And this seemed to make those reports, those bad apple reports, those anonymous things worse. You know, I'd already had them attacking me about the modelling thing and I'd already been served these papers and found guilty of misconduct. And I think the professional standards department were getting all these reports in and they were almost like, oh, we need to do something with her, about her. So rather than saying, you know, to, to whoever it is who's uh, submitting these reports, because I understand that they can still respond to that person. And I don't know whether there is anything in the fact it is truly encrypted because I've heard of things in the past where people have submitted something and it's been something that's really like detrimental and they've mm -hmm. managed to get back in touch with that person. So I, I don't know, I don't buy that it's completely anonymous, but... Did you ever know who was putting the complaints in? No, I mean, I've gone through a whole... Um, How many people are you working with? There's only about 12, 1300 in the force oh. that I was working. So it's a, I think it's second largest county with yeah, the fewest massive. officers. But you know yourself, if one's against you, they can have a little three or four friends and yeah. enough allegations, enough statements against your complaints, then that's going to stick. People yeah. higher up are not maybe seeing what's really going on because yeah. I can see you're a wee bit shaking and a wee bit emotional with everything that's went on. And if they've got enough complaints, they're thinking, well, maybe something's not right. Yeah. So I got called in for like what they call an ethical interview to say like, oh, tell us about this, tell us about that. So obviously trying to speak to them about about it, you know, and there's this really like bad, bad view of um, the whole thing with the modelling and stuff like that. It's it's almost like there's so many things that have gone on with cops, you know, corruption and things like that. I mean, we see in other forces, you know, cops who have stalked and then gone on to kidnap and, and rape and murder. And, you know, there's so many cases, high profile cases with cops doing real things wrong. And if the worst thing you want to attack me because I've got a good Instagram with good pictures because I go to the gym because I look after myself, you know, that's sexual discrimination in itself all day long. I was good at my job. Find something on me that means that I'm not performing, you know, a performance issue or something but they couldn't find anything on like that. And it's almost like all these reports are coming in, as you just said, so we've got we've got to find, there's, some, there's got to be something in this. Um, and you expect, obviously, with the police, for them to take action. You know, people report stalking, they report harassment, they report bullying, and the police are duty-bound. But it seems that when you're in, and it's happening to you, um, the police are not very good at looking after their own, and it's very, it's very, very sad that it comes to that. To be honest with you, do you feel let down by that? Absolutely let down. I mean, this is only, this is only like the start of where the problems were for me. Um, completely let down because I kept saying to them all the time, and I, I, um, I got an out of force federation rep to 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 support me uh, from a bigger force area. And obviously um, was with me through that misconduct investigation where they found me guilty in the end. And um, he said, like, if this happened in my force, this this wouldn't be allowed to happen because it's ridiculous. But, you know, it's there's a, there's so much corruption in there because one of the, the, the person who was supposed to be independent who was overlooking my um, the allegation of the modelling, he was supposed to be independent and not be involved at all. Um, he'd previously worked in professional in, in the professional standards department, and I raised that and I said he's worked in your department before, and they turned around and said, oh, you know, um, that was a long time ago. He's in completely independent. What happened after he found me guilty of misconduct is he got promoted into that department. So everything about it is. Just you know, it just stinks. It's it, it was just horrible. You know, it's just so much corruption after corruption. It's almost like they all had, you know, the secret handshake. You know, well, let's do something with her and everything else. It just do you feel I, as if you're a scapegoat for somebody's promotion. I feel partly that, and I feel partly because I stood up for myself and tried to be like, no, this isn't this isn't right. I didn't roll over. I didn't delete Instagram posts. I didn't admit that I was 
modeling because you know what I wasn't I got paid for nothing just because I look the way I do I train and I go on nice holidays on my annual leave why should I be treated differently to anybody else everybody has the same opportunities in life the same opportunities to be promoted the same opportunities to look after themselves um it wasn't anything to do with the way that I was performing in the workplace which is what was the upsetting thing so then if we we move a little bit further forward um, I'd, I'd taken time off as well because when they serve the misconduct papers, it's horrendous. Like you feel as though the whole world is crashing down on you. And when he found me guilty of misconduct, um, you have uh, you get served like a, a notice. And if I have to go to court f for something, I have to disclose this misconduct finding to the court. And I was so embarrassed. I was like, every time I was dealing with something, I think if I have to go to court and then that gets brought up at court, what I'm going to admit to the courts that, or oh, yeah, I've got a finding for misconduct because I continue to model despite I'm not a model, despite the fact that I put business interest in and it was rejected. It was all like really strangely done. And it was just, I tried all the time to have these meetings to speak to people and it was just everything that I was doing was being scrutinised. Every time I went to work, I was scared that I was going to be told, oh, just come with us into this room, because it happened three times. I was served with misconduct papers three times. and um, For all the same things? Yeah, you know, all along the same things. So the, the last one um, for me that for me that really got to me as well was I was contacted by professional standards to say the head of professional standards she seemed to have a problem with me because she was always saying I need to meet you about this and she'd always bring this other lady with her that se uh, seemed to be some or she claimed to be a social media expert who said that if you have more than 12,000 followers I think her number was then you was classed as an influencer so you need to put all your social media on I streamed on um, Twitch at the time, which is obviously where you stream games. You can stream whatever you want, games, whatever. Um, and because I was gaming, um, I had to declare to them in my business interest that I was doing that, even though there was loads of coppers that were streaming games. And, you know, um, they didn't care about that. But because it was me, for some reason, I had to put this in a business interest as well. They wanted all these different things covering, you know, how many followers I had and all of this. And it was just... Yeah. Um, if everybody else is doing it, then why you? Why do you feel like you're a target? I don't know. I feel, feel as though... Did you ruffle any feathers in there or were you... Like, no, this is the thing. And I would understand if... I think I ruffled feathers by people being jealous because obviously I'd, I'd spent some time on restricted duties because of my shoulders and they felt like, oh, look, she's... she's uh, and I feel because I got promoted, which I did through my own hard work, I feel as though people had their noses turned up because of that. And I feel with the professional standards and the way they kept gunning for me, it's because I didn't roll over and say, you know what, you're right, I'm sorry. And every time they told me, delete this picture or do this or do that, I didn't roll over and say it. I stood up for myself and said, no, it's not It's not right. You, you're not an influencer if you've got over this many thousand followers. My social media is for my personal use and enjoyment. And I tried to reason with them. So instead of saying, you know what, sorry, and I, I tried to kind of do that. Um, Who decides? certain amount of followers means you're an influencer? I don't know. This lady who worked within, she was one of the civilians that worked with there. And as part of my, I, I ended up getting um, a, a legal advice, basically, uh, with a view to obviously taking action against the police. And I had a claim running for, I think it was six years in the end. Um, and when I got all the disclosure from that, I saw that the Professional Standards Department had printed off loads of stuff from the internet about what it means to be verified on Instagram, what it means to be an influencer. So I think this claim that she was a social media expert was a self-proclaimed, you know, it's just that somebody had been tasked with find out what it means because I don't think they understood themselves what it meant. Um, How long was this going on for? A long time. Like the So basically I was, after two years of being... Assad. So from around 2015, so in 2015 as well, I, that was my first misconduct in 2015 was because on Christmas Day I went to a colleague's house for a cup of tea 
So I'm from Yorkshire. I don't, I don't, I didn't work in, in Yorkshire. So on Christmas Day, all cops can go home on Christmas Day to see their families, to let their kids open the presents because I wasn't from the area. Um, and I was on my own at Christmas. I went with one of my colleagues who was going home. His wife was there, his two little girls opened presents and then went and got on with our, with our jobs, basically. Went to a custody suite. I did the reviews because I was an inspector at this point, so I was doing what they call acting. So I'd passed my promotion. I was in the rank of, of um, acting inspector. And um, and then, so I did all, basically went and reviewed people's detention in custody. We took a prisoner who'd been in overnight back to the area where we were going. And um, somebody reported that by a bad apple system again or several people did and I got pulled in by a chief inspector who was the area commander um, after Christmas and got served with misconduct papers saying that I had neglected my duties as a police inspector by going to somebody's house on Christmas day which is what everyone did and um, went through a whole over a year of, for them to find um, there was no findings of misconduct. So yet again, obviously there was the modelling one where they found me guilty. There was this one where they didn't find me guilty because there was no misconduct. Um, and uh, and then obviously I have a third misconduct where basically they was looking at monitoring my social media all the time. And basically if I wore a brand of something, they'd be like, you haven't submitted... Um, you haven't obviously told us that you're working for them, you're modelling for them. And I'd be like, I'm not. So we had a new chief, uh, we had a new assistant chief constable come in and I was off work sick at the time. Um, deputy chief constable, sorry, he was a deputy, um, a Scottish guy. And he came in and he was like, look, what can I do to get you back in the workplace? And I said to him, look, this is what's been happening to me. I'm getting all these bad apple reports. I've been told that I'm modelling. I've done this business interest I've been found guilty of misconduct and it was like whoa no 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 I'm all about like pushing um, women to do well in the police and you know I'm all about driving women to be successful in policing let me let me get you back into the workplace because I was off sick at this point you know I was so stressed out I've, I've, be, I've been on medication for years you know for anxiety and depression because of all of this um he says let me let me look at this um, I'm going to get all that business interest stuff boshed off. There's no need for you to have one. Even though I'd already been found guilty of it, didn't get rid of my finding for misconduct. But he's like, I haven't got a problem, even if you did do modelling, you know. If you modelled in your swimsuit, fine by me. If you did lingerie, I might be a little bit more dubious because obviously you're still like the face of the public, but I wouldn't say no. Um, let me sort this out and let's get you back into the workplace. So basically in the beginning, he was like really, really like supportive. He was trying to get me back to work and all the rest of it. And then still all these bad Apple reports are going in and professional standards are still on my back. And I have the head of professional standards saying, you're wearing, um, you're wearing rock star energy. And I'm like, yeah, that's, you know, I'm not working for them I've just I bought it you know you can buy from America we want receipts we want proof that you have purchased that yourself I'm like this is ridiculous you know another police officer might be wearing Adidas it doesn't have to prove where you know how he got that Adidas top he's not sponsored by them he's not being paid by them he's just wearing it it just seemed to be everything that I did was being watched and monitored and this is where I say harassment bullying you know, stalking my accounts, my social media. And they'd send me emails with, you know, prints of my social media posts. And imagine like being called to a meeting and then, you know, senior ranking officers sat around the table with my, my Instagram pictures of me in swimsuits and stuff blown up to A4 size, you know, embarrassing. You know, I know it's on social media and, it, and people say, oh, I've got no sympathy. You're putting it out there, expect for people to see it. But to be sat there and saying, explain yourself why you've got this, why you're wearing this or what's going on here. You know, it's like, I just felt like, you know, it was just too much. It was just, you know, completely like in my life, in my world, um, caused so much problems, ruined my relationship, ruined my career. They ruined, you know, me as a person. I used to be, have so much more confidence, you know, with all of this stuff, it kind of put a dampener on me doing, because I was doing my, uh, I did personal training qualifications during lockdown, um, because obviously I was on maternity leave because I had my, my first child. 
and I was doing on on Twitch. I was doing um, personal training. I was on maternity leave. I was still getting harassed by the police. You know, oh, um, how much money are you making on Twitch? You know, you need to you need to tell us about that because we need to consider whether that now needs to go in a business interest. And it was just all the time, no matter where I was or what I did, they were there, you know, watching what I was doing, even when I'm not at work anymore. Um, and as I said about them printing off my accounts and stuff, they had this big, massive deal about Rockstar Energy, you know, who make the energy drinks. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, I, I kept arguing with this, this head of professional standards, you know, it's mine, it, there's nothing in it. So I thought, you know, I'm going to go back to that, that deputy chief constable who said that he'd support me again. And I went and I called a meeting with him. And it was, I, I think it was not long before or just after Christmas, around that time. And I called in this meeting with him. Um, and he, um, when I got in there with him, he had that head of professional standards with him, sat next to him. And he had a legal representative sat there. And I went without any support, so no federation rep or anything. I thought I was going to have a chat with somebody who'd previously been supportive. And for a whole hour, hour and a half, they completely destroyed me, brought me to tears. It was basically telling me that she, this, this woman, head of professional standards, said things like, you know, you've gone running to mummy, mummy says no, and now you've gone running to daddy as in saying that, you know, this is how they spoke to me. Belittled me, like made me feel like trash, like a baby, you know. You do as you're told. And this, this deputy chief constable screaming at me across his table, same distance to what you are now, basically telling me that because I was wearing rock star, like nobody had previously told me this, so I couldn't give them the opportunity to tell them that they were wrong. He's saying rock star energy makes the game Grand Theft Auto. And I'm saying, no, no, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know. They're different entities. Rock star games was a different founder, different place to the energy drink. They're different companies. And he's like, look, I'm telling you, I'm from Glasgow. I know, I've been to their head office. And I know that uh, Rockstar Energy makes the game Grand Theft Auto. And by you wearing that on a bikini, on a hat, um, in Grand Theft Auto, you can drive cars and you can kill prostitutes. So basically, you doing this, you wearing this, is condoning the killing of prostitutes. And that means it's incompatible with policing. And I've told you, and you're not listening, and this, and everyone is like banging on the desk and they were shouting at me. And I was like, you know, I, I you know, he's like, you're never going to get promoted and all of this stuff, because I was back to sergeant at this point, you know. So not only are they, they accusing me of stuff, it's almost like I, I was just destroyed. Basically, I couldn't even walk down the steps. I was from this meeting with no support, no one having my back. And um, I was like, yet again, I've gone in there because I wanted to speak to him and say, look, this, this woman in professional standards is telling me to remove these, these and these images. And you've said to me before, you've not got a problem with my social media and what I post. So I went to him for help, you know. And to, and to have him to have that woman and a legal rep in a meeting, you know, and and scream and shout at me and tell me basically because I'm not listening, I'm not doing as I'm told, you know, treating me like a child, that I'm not going to be promoted, and you know, and I I I just I just couldn't I couldn't deal with with them, and I, I think someone got me on the stairs and got some somebody to come and sit with me, and it took me like an hour and a half to calm down to be able to drive the hour and a half back home, because I was so so upset by it. I've been attacked by the media because all these anonymous reports, you know, professional standards were dealing with me, but I think the cops, whoever it was, is, was reporting me, or maybe even professional standards were putting a few in themselves, you know, who knows? because I wasn't doing as I'm told. Maybe they were involved as well. Um, they, uh, there was reports in there. I've got to see them. And the only reason I've got to see them is because I got a lawyer. I got a legal team solicitor. And um, it was basically going to be for, for work, work-based work stress, causing me to have, obviously, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, because of bullying and harassment in the workplace. And... Um, I um so I had obviously the legal team and this is the only way I've got to see these bad apple reports and read them and physically have a look at them. Um and there was so many, like pages and pages, hundreds and hundreds of reports, admittedly by professional standards 
and the police's own accounts, the worst case, the worst number of reports through that system that they've ever seen on any cop in the history of policing. Um, and that to me says something. If you know that and you can, you, you know, then why aren't you standing up and saying collectively to the whole force, this needs to stop, you know, and, and you know, I should then become a victim. I asked them to crime, you know, harassment and they refused to do it. It's not harassment. But if anybody else, a member of the public, walked in and said, you know, I'm having all these reports, it would be harassment then. So with the media thing in 2018, some of those bad apple reports were saying, oh, maybe I should tell the newspaper about this. Maybe I should do this. Maybe I should do that. So obviously whoever these people were, were then making the threat that they were going to go and to the newspaper. And it seemed every time I come back into work from a period of sick, because of my mental health, which may I add, was something that was I was told to do by our own, um, we have your own force, occupational health. So I was sent to occupational health by work and they deemed me unfit for work because obviously I was too stressed to deal with it. They took me off front line policing because they didn't want me to make, you know, command decisions as a supervisor because my head wasn't straight. You know, so everything that I was enjoying doing was being pulled away from me all the time, all the time. It's been snatched away from me, snatched away from me. So everything that I loved and enjoyed. So in the end, the occupational health doctor said, you know, you're not fit for work. Until they complete these misconduct investigations, you're not fit to come back to work. So obviously you go to your doctor, you get signed off. And obviously the, the bad apple reports are still happening while I'm off sick. And somebody does go to the media. So I think I came back to work and the first or second day back at work, I got told I needed to go up and see some other supervisor and he had an email from, I think it was the Daily Mail, that said they were going to um, they were going to run a story on the fact that I was travelling the world at the taxpayer's expense whilst off, whilst off work sick. Now, you and I know, because we use social media and everybody in the world knows, that you can post a picture right now of you being in Paris, for example. It doesn't mean you're in Paris. Mm -hmm. So, you know what? I enjoyed my social media. I had a lot of support on there and I was still post, even when I was off work. Why shouldn't I? No one said that I couldn't post anything. But what would happen is um, whoever it was who'd gone to the press had saying that whilst I was off work sick, I was in all these places, you know. So the press run an article, I think, in 2018 saying, you know, a glamorous cop travelling the world at taxpayers' expense and, you know, ran... It went worldwide. It wasn't just local. It was, you know, in every country that you can imagine and there was there was, there was, was stuff, articles done um, online and old magazines and things like that. You know, I was being slandered and I always kept my mouth shut because I had, obviously legal advice and support and I didn't I know how the media can twist things and turn things and I thought if I stand up for myself or I try and give my version of it then you know it's just going to get twisted I don't know who to trust I don't know I lost a lot of my if I can't trust the police as a police officer if the worst has happened to me then how can I trust anybody else and I still have trust issues now because the police are supposed to be there to protect you know, to uphold, to uphold the law, to protect you, to support you. And if I, as a police officer, I'm getting, you know, bullied and harassed and tormented and, you know, victimised and destroyed, you know, me made mentally unwell by my own, then how do I, who do I turn to? Who well, protects me? Why did you stick it so long? Um, I kind did of Did you ever think about deleting your Instagram or putting it private as well? Or were you just so stubborn towards it? I'm not bowing down to you. Yeah, I think because I got in so deep with it, I wanted to stand up for myself to be like, you know what, you're wrong. You're wrong. You can't, why can't I be? Why do I have to be different to anybody else in the police? You're not making him, her, 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 or him, anybody delete theirs. You're not making them make theirs private. You're not telling them to pull posts. And I kind of felt like because I had legal advice and I had a federation rep from outside of force that was on my side and it was kind of like, you know what, what you're doing is no different to what I see in my force. You know, I kind of felt I need to stick at this. I've started it. I've dug my heels in. I wanted to make a stand. You know, we're in 2023 now. Cops have TikTok and all sorts. And that wasn't, a th well, it was starting to be a thing before I left. 
Now you've got cops doing full TikToks in front of police cars when they're on duty. <laughs> Your There's dad's so not about much gay, out there. Parade, gay pride and fucking yeah. madness, dyeing their hair and And all I'm doing is, is having nice pictures and posting them on my social. I'm not, there's no racial language. There's no, there's nothing. Everything is a positive, inspirational quote. It's like work hard, you know, do this, do this, and you can have this too. Everything's positive. Even though my whole world was crashing down, and this is why when I was off sick with my mental health and I was really struggling and I was really dark, posting that picture with a positive, like you'll never see anything dark or depressing on my, on my social media. Not sexual? No, nothing, nothing. Because even though like I'm feeling the way I am inside, I want to I want to portray that I'm happy and this, that and the other because people don't like to read doom and gloom. I think there's been two or three posts that I did since I resigned from the police where I've posted a picture in you know, in uniform where I've said it's for this reason, bullying and harassment, but kept it very, you know, minimal words. Um and I will have my say because I, I do want to have my say. I've I've kept my mouth shut. I've not I've not although I stood up for myself when I was in to some extent, they've still won in some in some extent. Some ways they have, some ways they haven't. Because in some respects, I've left now. They've got what they wanted. All of it was a push to get me out. You know, I was too much of a problem child, clearly. You know, I didn't listen, I didn't roll over, I didn't do what I was told. Because honestly, I don't believe that if you are not doing anything wrong, you shouldn't be able to stand up for yourself. You know, and as I said, people have TikToks, they post pictures of them in uniform, they're doing all sorts of stuff now, and that's allowed. You know, times change, people need to move on, and just people, you know, police officers are real people. They have real lives, they still go on holiday, they still get to the gym. Why can't they share that, you know? Why was it made into such a big deal then? This is the thing. I would love to Did know you have, myself... Like an affair with anybody, like sleep with anybody's man, would have just no. because it seems a bit extreme for somebody being jealous of just an Instagram account. Yeah. How in depth they've went with yeah. all the complaints and with is, the media. That like, was there any anything that you could have done? Maybe I pissed them off a bit because they've went extreme. Yeah. They've went next level to yeah. destroy you. They've seen you being destroyed though. Yeah. And they've been getting maybe some kind of fucking fun from it. The te- right, mind going sad. deteriorating like when did it come on top for you in the mindset when it's just completely broke when i when it broke yeah. me um so no this is the thing i always looked all the time i wanted to know all the time what is it that i've done that really really grates on somebody why are people so horrible you know what is it and i honestly think it's just jealousy they just looked at me and thought you know she's being promoted she's she gets to go on these holidays she's got these nice pictures with an account my instagram got um got uh, verified uh, shortly after all that media stuff because there was a media thing you know and then people that think that made people a bit worse because they thought i'm going to destroy her but actually i got something out of it because i got verified and obviously i went my instagram blew up and it grew loads of followers and stuff like that because people were interested yes don't get me wrong there was lots of lots of negative things said you know you know what people are like and a lot of people dislike the police but actually there are some decent people in the police not everyone should be labeled the same way as as the, as made out but i've also had the worst experience and and on heart now i've left the police i've probably got three or four people that i'm actually friends with that i've remained friends with and i've been out now since since almost three years and that's sad because even in the depths of your despair the ones who you think that that are your buddies they're actually not uh, people are quick to turn their back on you. So I needed people as part of my legal case to be witnesses. Oh, yeah, mate, I'll be a witness, you know. I've seen what they're doing to you. It's awful, it's awful. When it comes to the crunch and they have to put pen to paper, disappear. Shit houses, yeah. man. Listen, and this the is, world you is learn, full of them. Yeah. And you, you, the thing is, you've learned the hard way. Yeah. You've been yeah. naive to people yeah. just talking pure shit. And I would love to know why. You know, I've never done anything to anybody. I always tried to be a good boss. You know, I never had to to challenge or stick anybody on or get, you know, to, to do anybody's legs to get my promoted. I worked hard. And I think I am just a victim of my success in that. I wanted to work hard. I want. I knew what I wanted and I went for it. And I just didn't bow down and, and, and listen to for them telling me, oh, you've done this, you've done that. But because I believed that I would, you know, I'd done nothing wrong, I wanted to stand up for myself. So mm-hmm. I think, um, 
Yeah, I just, I just. How hard is it for a female to bend the coppers? Um, it's it is hard. It's still very much a male-dominated place. Did you um, feel as if a lot of other girls struggled, or was it just? Did you um, just feel like the target was on you? I I felt as though it was personally on me. I don't. There's there's a few. There's very few women and. I don't know, there wasn't many that obviously used their social media in the way that I did and was successful in that sense. But, you know, I enjoyed that aspect of it. I created it and I wanted to be positive and I did my fitness and I shared my fitness journey and my travel and stuff like that. So I was different in that sense, in that I had this passion to have the two things. And I don't think the police then felt that you could have those two things. You know, if you're a public figure, you should just come to work and do policing. You shouldn't have that presence online. Why shouldn't you? You know, my accounts were completely separate. People in my social media world thought that I was a personal trainer. No one knew I was a cop. The first time they knew I was a police officer was in 2018 when that colleague went to the newspaper and said, look, look at this Instagram, look at her. She's travelling the world at the taxpayers and they started writing all these articles. Then they knew I was a police officer. I don't understand though how, how people came with photos on the beach can affect. What's, what's their method behind like not having a big social media or not putting bikini photos on? I don't understand that. No. What is the message behind it is it for your own protection or what like what is that they they didn't really have one basically they're trying to make out was modeling and this is where they said, even if you were can't you do side hustles if you're in the coppers if you submit a business interest like a, let's yeah say. so you can have anything i think there's only a few things that you can't do you can't basically have like a public house or you can't be married to somebody who owns a pub or something because of the legal aspects of landlords and stuff but if you uh, made a craft or you did this or you did that or, or you put modelled or whatever on the side as long as you've done a business interest or basically you can rent out property that's a side hustle as long as you mm. made them aware and it's all taxed and stuff like that seems very controlling yeah so. but you can do it as long as you make them aware but this is the thing they said i was modeling i said i'm not modeling they said well submit a business interest okay well you're telling me i have to so i submitted one they rejected it and then did me for misconduct you have a suicidal with it all yeah, I have. And even now I have my moments and it makes me sad because I've got two beautiful kids. You know, I um, I always got asked, and this is just me being completely honest now, like when I went to the when I went to see the force occupational doctor and this is what made me upset as well because whilst they were claiming I was travelling the world at the taxpayers expense off of my mental health I had to go to all these meetings you know see my own GP see the force doctor um and and you know be in different places see my federation rep you know and so how could I be you know traveling the world or whatever just because I'm posting that I'm happy doesn't mean I am I even got told by the force um, nurse, she says to me, if you were fat and ugly, you wouldn't be having these problems right now. And for a force nurse to tell you that, that the reason I'm having these problems is because of that tells you something, speaks volumes. You know, she's a nurse who's seeing me at my lowest. I mean, yeah, okay, it's not very helpful advice, but there's something in that, you know. She's saying, oh, you know, this is why people are, people are attacking you. And, you know, I have. I have felt suicidal and I've won I've plotted it all out in my mind what I would do when I would do it. Wait for my kids to go to sleep, you know, where I would go, what I would do, and it breaks my heart because then I look at them and I'm like, they don't deserve that. And then some of me says, Maybe they do deserve that because maybe they'd be better off without me, because some days are a struggle for me. Some days are a struggle and now I've just got back into doing my fitness streaming again. And I've gone over to a new platform which is Kick. And they're um, kind of, you've got Twitch, I mean, that's always been there. Kick's quite new. They're a streaming platform. And I started doing my, I went over there probably about six weeks ago now. And I was on there. And it's a basically half American, half Australian site that the people behind it are. And I went on there and, and one of the staff um, talent spotted me. And they were like, oh, you know, we like uh, the fact that you do fitness. Um, I took a personal training qualification when we were in lockdown because I was streaming over on, on Twitch um, my workouts. I did Pilates and personal training. And um, so I've got these qualifications. And and I and I spoke to this this guy and um, they're kind of like the, um, 
the kick team, you know, the the support team and the staff behind it. And they talent spotted me with like, we really want to push our fitness aspect of our of our platform. And so I'm working towards um, partnered, being partnered by them. Um, so I'm online doing my fitness training and stuff like that. And, you know, I have to paint on this image. And people think, oh, look at her. She's so confident. You know, she's, you know, she's, she's got a good figure. She does this, that and the other. People don't see the side of me when I have to turn my lights off at night and when I'm not on camera, you know, and what it's done to me and how it's destroyed me. Yeah, I have to be positive in front of people and I help I'm one of these people who wants to help other people but I don't get a lot of help back you know what the police have done to me is they've destroyed me and I was never unwell with my mental health before you know it's pushed me to the point of not wanting to be here anymore you know it's destroyed my confidence it's ruined my relationship because when the media the media even found out where I lived came to my house and told my partner at the time, oh, you do know that she's having an affair, you know, to to, to antagonise him, to get him to react. You know, it's caused me to lose my relationship and my brother and my dad in Yorkshire, how the media find where people live is beyond me. They went to my dad's house, got a story out of him by trying to make out that they were... You know, they were trying to get a story on me from when I was a police officer and he didn't know any of the stuff that was happening to me at work because kind of you want to protect your parents a little bit. You want them to make them feel as though you're doing okay. My brother, his kids, um, he, I think they went to my brother's neighbour's house and told told the neighbour that he wasn't the father of his children, you know, to get him to react so that he'd kick off because it's the juiciest story. You know, lots of stuff has happened to me because of what, of, because of what I've lived what I've lived through. I was in the police for 13 years. I loved it. And, you know, the police are supposed to look after you. I think on my last, uh, on one of the last misconducts, on my first day back at work, they sent me on my own, to the, or there wasn't anybody to go, so I went to, to a guy who'd hung himself. You know, and I dealt with that as a single female officer that had just come back to work with, obviously, on re on recuperative duties, they call it, because obviously I still wasn't feeling great with my own mental health. And I go to a hanging, you know, and there's no, there's nobody checking in on me if I need any support, if I need any backup. I just go on and deal with it. Do you think they've sent you there to break you? It, it does, yeah. It, it destroys you. See, I've interviewed enough coppers and undercover coppers, man, and the stuff that they see and they do, and the thing mm. is, there's no support for them. No. Same as veterans. I don't agree with wars, but it was happened. And the amount of veterans that are homeless, basically go and fight for us, make us make us more powerful. But yet when you come back, nobody fights for them. No. <clears throat> and that's it. As you're just a pawn in a game, you leave. There's something taking yeah. your place. Oh, undercover coppers. A guy always mentioned we went undercover pedophile. 20 years, man, he went under seeing the sickest shit. And, it, and it's kind of no support. Undercover prostitute, kind of no support. Um, Neil Woods, great guy. He used to do kid on he was a junkie, had to pretend to take drugs sometimes and his his head's gone being another character and there's no support, man, for people mm -hmm. who actually putting it out there on the front line to fucking help save people. Yeah. Fuck them. Yeah. Like you say, there's good coppers as well. I've interviewed a lot of decent person yourself and are, they all sound everybody's fucking sound, but I can see the destruction in their mindset. Yeah. I can see, I've interviewed murderers that are sitting here calm as fuck. But yet you're only trying to do the right thing and you're broken by it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, are you taking medication or anything now? Yeah, yeah. What so do you take? take it. So I've got metazapine uh, for depression and, and and anxiety. It's supposed to deal with both. And then when obviously I was supposed to go to court recently, um, a couple of months, mm, just over a month ago. For what? March. So take take the police to court for an employment tribunal type thing. It's six years I was with the legal team for. And... Um, it got to nine days before and the council, so the head of uh, of my case dropped it, dropped the case, said I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not running this anymore, which left me in a in a predicament because obviously how am I gonna find somebody else to, to present my case? I'm not mentally strong enough to go and do it myself. You know, I've got like a sixty five page written statement that I've brought in my bag today. You know, it's typed as well. So 65 pages of typed. That's my experience of my policing. That was supposed to be my case. That was going to court. And um, I got questioned in a meeting just before, uh, so the nine days before, 
have you got OnlyFans? And I was like, yeah. Uh, and what are your earnings? So I had to send my earnings to, to them to look at. All right, we'll, we'll have a meeting with you in, a, in an hour or so. And that's when they come back and said, oh, yeah, we're not, uh, we're not going to pursue your court case anymore. After being with me six years, having meetings for six years with a legal team, taking statements, my witnesses, you know, I had police witnesses. Um, the date was set. It'd been cancelled like three or four times because of lockdowns and everything. And we had the date nine days before we're not doing it. And this council just pulled the plug like that. And we're like, why does my OnlyFans matter? You know, I I lost my job. I have children to, to provide for. I'm a single parent, you know. I have to pay, you know, for for childcare. I have to I have to live and survive. And you know what? OnlyFans isn't a big deal anymore. You can do whatever you want on OnlyFans. You know, it's it's a common thing. Like a few years ago, yeah, people were a bit more like prude about it. And yeah, because of that. So pulled the plug nine days before, decided that that was the case. And he said to me, you know, I they, they have an idea. Uh, so the justice system is supposed to be just and all the rest. They have an idea of who potentially could be on, um, who could be the judge. So they have a lineup of about five different people. And he was like, I know who it's going to be, and it's going to be this woman. And basically, she will have the view that she's never been allowed social media or to be herself on her socials. Because when you take the position of judge, you have to completely sanitise your life and not any of that. So she will form the view that you should have done the same. So because of this, and because of obviously the nature of your case, that's it, done, dropped. Bye. Do you do you regret keeping your socials? The way um, it's ended up mentally? Mm, no. Because I think to myself, I've been for all I've had. I'm not a malicious person and I don't want any I don't I would never have even wanted to do anybody's legs for what they've done to me. I would just like to know why. And if I can get anything out of this, it would be to make sure that no one else goes through what I've been through either. You know, because things are different now. Socials have come on and changed and everything else. I didn't have, obviously, OnlyFans and stuff when I was in, and I wouldn't dream of it because, obviously, the rules are the rules. But to have social media, just because I look different or I look after myself, I'm no different to anybody else. So I, I kind of feel as I needed to, to keep going and to keep pursuing that. Yeah, some people might say, well, that's stupid, you lost your career because of it. But you know what? If I can help somebody else... I want I want to make sure that no one has to experience what I've experienced, you know. I've had messages from so many cops, DMs in Instagram, you know, women, men. You know, I was treated like this. This has happened to me. I'm going through this right now. Or I was in the military. This is what happened to me. It happens so much. We're just blind to it, I think. Yeah. Or the police like to brush it under the carpet. Because as I said to you earlier... There's so many real crazy, like real criminal things going on with cops murdering, you know, raping and all of this. The statistics that come out all the time of all the convictions of police officers. I saw things that cops were doing when I was in. And the worst that I was doing was posting on my social media. You know, I mean, come on, get oh. with the program. It just, it just seems so wrong. So I think I got so far and I was like, I can't, I can't, um, I can't back down now. You know, I need to stand up for what's right. Yeah, fair play for that, man. Respect for that. Yeah. But I could understand if you had OnlyFans. I get it. If mm. there was disciplinaries and you were... I, I oh, yeah. understand that, million percent. But for Instagram and that, I kind of don't get it. But like you say, the shit that's happened with the Met Coppers, all the sex cases, this and that, and, and you're thinking, fuck's sake, you're going through all that shit for what? For showing yeah. a couple of bikinis and, and your bikinis. That See, when you... How much corruption, how deep does it go, though? in the coppers with the, the madness that like, because like you say there's i always say this as well there's good and bad everywhere in yeah. life and, I, and i've come across some amazing coppers i never thought i would say that fucking 10 years ago but yeah. amazing people now i know understand what police officers have to go through on a daily basis the, the suicides you need to see kids yeah. fucking rapes and it's sad dark yeah. shit that no human no human should ever see but they do it to try and clean up the streets and they genuinely want to clean up the streets listen there's pricks out there as well i've, I've came across them yeah. my fucking 40 years on this planet but how corrupt did you see it in the coppers um it's very corrupt 
put it this way, I would rather go out and deal with, like, walk through the streets of London on my own, you know, without my stab vest on. And I'd feel safer than I was going to work with my own damn colleagues because I'd, I'd more likely get a knife in my back from them than I would out there. And that's how sad it is. You know, they always said in the police when I joined, one of the big job losers would be to use a police national computer to look up somebody um, that you know, and people do it on family members or they get a new partner and they want to look up the ex or whatever. And that happens all the time. And that's supposed to be like, they always said to us, that's the biggest job loser because you're abusing a national computer, you know, to find out information or on cars or whatever. And I've seen people do that, still keep the job. They might get moved to a different station for a while, you know. And, you know, stealing things, racial stuff, you know, um, homophobic stuff. Uh, people have said things and whatever else. And they seem to go through these misconduct investigations. And then it seems to be that they're, they're fine, you know, either they're found guilty or not guilty or whatever else. And yet with mine, there was nothing ever, you know, legal or anything like that. Yet I went through all of I did for what? It just, um, yeah, it just, it's just not right. How was it when it all broke in the papers for you? Um, was horrendous. that the breaking point? Yeah, I mean, it, it completely destroyed me when they did that because I just felt as I, I weren't able to have my say. I wish, I kind of wish I had, I kind of regret it, but then I kind of think, well, I didn't, I, they probably would have got twisted anyway. So there was the first wave, and then about a week later, that was, she's travelling the world at taxpayers' expense in a bikini, you know, and then they did another one about a week later, basically saying that I was streaming games in my underwear for cash. So basically trying to make out that I was hustling money. I mean, if you did that on Twitch, then you would have got banned, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because they put a picture in the paper and a clip, newspaper clip of we wearing like a dress, like a nice summer dress, but underneath I had a bikini top on. So, okay, you're claiming that I'm doing it in my underwear or my bikini because I'm wearing it under my clothes. So it was just another try, you know. It was a second wave of media. Um, and they've, they've done articles, it seems like, every six months or it, you know, this cop, she's resigned from the police, well, then they did that one. And then, oh, look at her now, she's resigned from the police and she's got nearly 100,000 followers on Instagram. And it just seems to come around every so often. Oh, the OnlyFans one in November, they've run an article on that. So it's just like they seem to redo them every so often. But I've never had the chance to say, actually, you know what? This is the truth in it. These are the things I've been through. I've always just, I've probably not done myself any favours because people have never got to experience who I am or to understand really. I've probably made it look like, oh yeah, I did travel the world, you know. Yeah. That could be a negative when you when you don't say anything. Yeah. She's guilty. Yeah. What's your hiding? Yeah. But you must stand and fight. You've came this far. You're yeah. nearly fucking suicide. Yeah. There's a good chance you might not have been here. Yeah. For what? Yeah. Because if some prick says that you can't do this and can't do that, fuck them. Yeah. Like you're here, you're clearly here just to keep going. And a lot of people take a bit of inspiration that you never back down. So you can yeah. fucking go with your head held tight. But there yeah. comes a time in life as well, you've got to give yourself a fucking shake. Mm -hmm. Because no cunt's coming to save you. And I always repeat that stuff. Because you've already came through it all. Mm -hmm. So it shows you how strong you are. You're here for a reason. There's certain things people agree with, there's certain things they don't, but again, it's not their life. You've got kids. Mm. That's the only thing that you should be fighting for. Yeah. Fuck them. Yeah. Words, are, words are powerful. Words do kill people. Words do destroy lives. But there comes a time in your life where you've got to take the reins. There comes a time in your life and you go, do you know what? They've damaged me long enough. It's time to make fucking mass changes yeah. just to see the world a bit differently. It's in the past. You've sat here. You've, you're saying your piece. People go, do you know what? Fair play. Yeah, respect mm -hmm. that. And that's what it's all about. Like, see me you're going through it all then, and then how long did it take for you to do OnlyFans after it? Uh, a good couple of years. I only started it in November, and I left in November 2020. So yeah, it's two years. And how was that? Yeah, fine. It's it's a it's a different world. It's just like you know, if you can. The thing is with me, so I'm building my brand of me as, as my my Instagram, the leeway. I, I'm doing it as like personal training. So with the the kick thing, I'm doing training on there. I'm going to be partnered with them soon. The only fans are all like, you know, sources of income and revenue that can come in to sustain my life because my career and my passion was to be in policing. I wanted to stay in there. I wanted to do it until I was retired. You know, and I kind of sometimes feel bad because I've, you know, when you think your kids, so they look at police officers and like, oh, my mummy is a police officer and feel proud of you. I kind of, 
you know, sometimes feel a bit bad because I wanted to, and it kind of likes the fact that he would look at me and be like, oh, you used to be a police officer. But, you know, this is better for me because I get to do what I want to do without people scrutinising me all the time. So it's a different world. It's completely different. And I am, um, I'm one of these people who, what do you call it, when so institutionalised almost, I kind of feel as though, you know, I need to get up at a certain time and I have to do this, this and this, and then my payday is on this day. So it's a hard adjustment for somebody who for 13 years is used to set paydays, used to set, set structure of shift patterns and all the rest, to then be like, oh, you know what, I've got to build my own business and my own brand now. Um, but some a part of me thinks, well, that's also quite exciting as well. Yeah, listen, it's your life. Yeah. As long as you're not harming anybody, listen, I'm all for anybody doing what they want. If you want to have an OnlyFans, listen, do it. If people want to pay for it, do it. Mm. I'm not harming anyone. There's certain things that I wouldn't want my kids doing or what I'm doing, but that's my choices. Mm. Life's all about choices. Who the fuck is anybody to say? I've interviewed enough porn stars and OnlyFans, girls and male to do their thing yeah. and they're all fucking sound. They're not harming anybody. Yes, it might fuck them up upstairs, but... If I'm honest, your head's already fucking gone. Might as well make it work. <laughs> Might as well make some money from it. But <laughs> it's clearly, listen, you've stood and fought. And the reason you've not told your story then is because you probably weren't strong enough. No. You've been wanting to come on this podcast for a while now. Yeah. And there's, there's something been holding you back. And today's the day you, you get to see your piece. Yeah. People can understand you. Wait a minute, you went through a fucking rough time. You've been through under the bus. People were against you. You might not have been an angel in there. You could be on here talking pure shit. I don't yeah, know. Exactly. But the fact that you're here saying things from your side, yeah. it gives people a better understanding. They can make their own assumptions. And the bottom line is, man, there's a lot worse goes on in life. There's a lot worse yeah. goes on in life. Like, what do you do now? Like, how do you find some balance then with your life and try and move on from that? Because it's hopefully today can be that thing where you've released it and you yeah. feel a bit lighter. Yeah. Because you've been bottling up, bottling up. Nobody believes me. Everybody hates me. Why do they get me? Yeah. But there comes a time you've got to fucking let everybody yeah. go and move on. Or else it just damages you. You've yeah. got two amazing kids. That like, that's your that's your main fight. Yeah. Fuck the police, man. Like not in a negative, but the ones who were against you, fuck yeah. them. Really. Like what they really do in their life is that what they thrive on is trying to bring other people down. Yeah. But like I said, I don't have all the answers that you, what you've done or who you yeah. are. But I can only judge from what yeah. I'm seeing now. But there comes a stage where you've released that deep mm. breath and okay, how can I make positive changes with my life? Mm. Like how are you finding the balance now though with you? Like the attention and that you're getting now with the media and that yeah i mean that was my whole thing you put that you hit the nail on the head there it's almost like releasing the pressure because i've kept my mouth shut and you're almost like pressure brow pressure brow and every so often i have these bursts because i can't deal with the emotion anymore so i have breakdowns i cry i question myself Part of it was to come and speak to somebody who I trusted. I like the work you do. I like what you stand for and how you give people the opportunity just to speak and say how it is. It's not like a an interrogation. It's more of a come and speak to me. I needed that because I needed to offload. It's almost like therapy for me. I'm not saying you're my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Only charge 50 quid an hour. <laughs> it's cheap. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, that was part of it. The second is I want to write a book. Um, and I'm not one of these people, I said earlier, that I don't want to name and shame people. I could sit here and I could, like, basically, the people who know, who watch this, who know what they've done to me, will know without me saying the name. I, and they will know what they've done and they will know the truth behind it. And, you know, to me, that's that's my job done. Karma will get those ones who've done what they've done to me. Eventually, it'll catch up with them to write a book, to have the opportunity to speak to you, to get my version of what's happened to me. My book will basically be, this is what happened to me, these are my experiences, in more detail of what we've spoke about today. So more in a, a sort of time-stamped manner of the whole process mm -hmm. from start to finish, because there's a lot to say. Um, and that will be therapy. And I've thought, you know, oh, somebody else can do the hard work and write that. Actually, no. I've always maintained that I'm behind all my own socials because I think I do my own fitness training and all of that. I structure and, and organise my own workouts. I don't just put on a video of somebody else doing it and get everyone to join in. I I am the face behind my stuff, so I don't want somebody else to write it because actually right, putting that pen to paper and letting all of that come out is going to be my therapy as well. So now I think it's about 
building me back to where I was before. So now I've let some of the pressure out and I'm going to do my book. It's about focusing on my brand, you know, making sure that I can provide a good future for my children, you know, making sure that I can stand up for, making sure I can encourage other people. I've had so many people in my DMs. This has happened to me, that's happened to me, and I can help them, give them advice and support. Um, in the same force that I'm in, that's still happening to people. You know, uh, some girls contacted me and said, oh, I've been told that I've got to make my TikTok private and delete some of them because they're sexualized. a TikTok sexualized because you're showing a shoulder. I'm like, you know, it's still happening, so they clearly haven't learned anything from what's happened to me. But if I can be somebody else's power, somebody else's person that they can reach out to when they're in that deep, dark place where I was, then that's where I get my satisfaction from now, mm -hmm. from the fact that I've been through it and I've, I'm coming out the other side. It's been a difficult journey and it's not been easy, but I still have done it, you know, and I need to give myself some credit for that sometimes. And if I can help others and build other people up, women, men with mental health issues, whatever it might have happened to them, then that's where I'll get it. With their fitness, with positivity, whatever it is that I can help them, yeah. that's what I'm going to do. That's what it's all about. Believe it or not, the shit that you went through will make you stronger. You're clearly a fighter. So then you become the voice for the people who are too scared to speak out because I know the destruction that comes. If you don't dance to your tune, we're going to destroy you, basically. Mm. And listen, that's not just in the police force, that's in probably mm. majority of any fucking job. Like, yeah. You've got to abide by the rules or, or what, we're just going to crush you and crush you and crush you. Or else they could have just sacked you. Why did they not just sack you? Because I think they knew deep down that they were, they didn't have anything to sack me for. Mm. You can hide behind these misconduct things because they start with a verbal warning, written warning, final written warning, dismissal. So that's why I think every time a misconduct would disappear, there'd be another one. And I had the written warning for the modelling thing. And the, the rock star energy thing probably would have... I don't even know what, how they, that one got concluded. I think then I went on maternity leave and I think they binned it off in the end. But even when I wanted to come back off maternity leave, I contacted them about the hours that I was going to be working because obviously my, my youngest would have had to go to nursery and nursery doesn't open till half seven. Shifts start on early at seven. And the area commander was like, oh, no, you have to be here at seven. Um, it's not it's not compatible for police and for you to drop him off, um, for you to attend work at half seven. I'd be like, but I'll stay half an hour at the end of my shift. No, no, it's not compatible. But there's so many other women in the police and men who start their shifts and do family-friendly hours. And again, it was seemed to be because it was me. So I never went back. You know, I, I got towards the end of my maternity leave. They started causing problems with what my hours would be when I went back. And I was like, that's it. I've got to pull the plug now. I can't, I can't do this. And I just held on to the fact that I had this legal case and I would fight through that process and hopefully, you know, get some somewhere out of that. How was it working in the control room? How hard a job is that? Like hearing people screaming down oh, the phones? Oh, that's quite and, stressful. Yeah, I've never had, spoke to anybody that's done that job. So how was that? Um, it's horrible. I've I've dealt with things where, you know, I've I, one of them that sticks in my mind the worst is a, a little girl or boy, I don't know, about seven, that says, my dad stabbed my mum and she's dead. And you have to listen to that. And yeah, you, you can hear the man in the background, you know, like, oh, what have I done? What have I done? And you can, and you can just hear silence and this kid crying. And it's like, even now I've got goosebumps. Um, I've also, because I never worked in the area that I... Um, lived however um being the county where i was people came on holiday there and i once had to deal with the calls of one of my dad's best friend's stepsons got killed on a motorbike uh, with his real dad so basically my dad's best friends was the stepdad of this little boy who'd gone for the weekend with his real dad uh, on the back of his motorbike to the seaside and uh, had a collision with a, a, a car and was dead and i took Weirdly, that you can imagine a control room with all these different people sat in chairs, both calls. So the one about the crash didn't put two and two together. Then the one from the hospital that called the time of death of the little boy. And I, both of those calls came to me. And it's so weird that that would happen. I think that working in that control room and listening to that and being not being able to deal with it is far more difficult than the cops on the ground. Because at least when you're on the ground you can process all the information you can help i think there's nothing worse than hearing it and not being able to help somebody mm. i've i've found that more traumatizing listening 
and not being able to, you know. Do you think that could have been the start of the mental health as well, though, like hearing that trauma and pain? I don't think so. I don't. I don't think because so. it's dark stuff. Yeah. Like I say, it's not normal. And trying to be a strong person and bottle all that stuff yeah, up, it's maybe, tough. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like hearing people and yeah. screaming. I had an amazing man, Dan Cross, on, and he has misses phoned him. Um, somebody was burglaring the house. The burglar came in and killed her while these two kids were still in the house. Mm. They just he was miles away. It's a mad story and such an amazing man. Like, but you can see the pain as well. That like, so it's a lot of trauma you deal with as well. It's not just the shit yeah. that you went through all the the sh the madness that went against you. It's just the other stuff that comes with it. Like, yeah. is there much training for that sort of job? Like afterwards and therapy. Are people they used to, speak to, to be. Her? They used to be. You know, when I was first in the job, we used to have like fifteen cops on one shift, and it was amazing. There's fifteen. You'd always be double crewed and stuff like that. And then it went down to that same police station. Now they have three, four, or five of them on a shift. And there was um, trim. They call it trauma. Some, I can't remember the words. Instant management. Something. Um, and it was a lady and she used to come out to this oh, to the station and she used to sit and let you talk to her. And they've done away with that. And now they have courses where they train cops to have that like qualification. But basically they just go on like a two or three day course and they become trim trained. And then if uh, an incident happens and the sergeant or inspector deems that that officer needs that support, they will put them in touch with that person. And so I think it's been watered down and there isn't the support, but how can I assess that you need it if you don't speak up and need it? And this is where I think it's all fallen apart. I think as everything, you know, it's too fast paced, there's not enough staff and people aren't looked after the way they were. And then you wonder why, because obviously I was a supervisor and but I was good at recognising if my officers needed, you know, that support and stuff. Because when I was obviously younger in service, I didn't have kids, but things like cot deaths and things like that, very, very like, for the for the guys who were on my shift that had kids at home, I wiped three of my staff out that needed, you know, some time off. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, Christmas Day as well, you know, things that happen around those times, it's when it becomes, when, when it becomes personal and you come, you've got kids yourself and that happens, it does sort of impact. What's a positive of being in the police force? Um, the life skills, I think it's given me, I've become quite robust, um, in dealing with stuff. So if, uh, if something happens, I'm quite good now of like being aware of my surroundings. And I think it helps with my children in that I, I, I've just been away on my <laughs> alone uh, abroad with them. And I'm very good at like assessing the whole surroundings and being good at, you know, dealing if an incident happens or being good at helping other people. Um, it's given me a lot of skills that I wouldn't have got. I've, I'm grateful for the experience. I loved my job. I would still be doing it right now. But I think I said to you earlier, <clears throat> I'd sooner go out and deal with the public. It's the same people as day in, day out. Yeah, you get new people coming along. Um, then I would for my colleagues because it was them that I was most fearful of. Because I was wondering when I was going to next be accused of something or pulled in for something. Um, and that destroyed it for me. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think just the skills and the experiences and the things I've got to see and, and do and whatever else. So how do you go over everything that you've just said today? How do you really just close the chapter for it? Do you feel as if once the book's out, you can just kind of move on from it? I think it? so. I think so. I think yep. it'll take time. You know, it's going to take more time. I think I need to write my book, get it out there, what's happened, what's been said and continue to help people who step up and say, look, this is what I'm experiencing, this is how I'm feeling. And then, you know, over time, time's a healer and everything. And I think you said something earlier that made me think. People always say, you know, sticks and stones break your bones, but words, they can't hurt you. My parents brought me up saying that, and that I, I hate that. Because actually, I'd rather you broke 10 bones in my body than I would of the experiences that I've been through in the police. Because the words and what I've been called and what the media has called me and all of the rest, you know, it's more damaging because it stays in there. You know, a, a broken bone, it heals over time, but the words and people have said to you, they're there, aren't they? They're for life. Yeah. That's why I say like, words kill people. That, yeah, they do. They like, do. Bullying online, trolls online kill people. The media yeah. kill people with articles of that. Accusations, they're printing stories, no yeah. charges or anything. I've had many people on the podcast who have accusations. Listen, innocent to proven guilty, I get it. And there's people who get away with many things that are fucking blatantly guilty. Yeah. There's many people who've not done anything 
but a certain article's destroyed their whole life. Yeah. There needs to be something in place to protect people. Print the story, go to court, and follow the case from day one and, and print whatever's been said. Yeah. yeah, a million percent. But don't print something about something because somebody gave you a, a, a source and writing shit and yeah. damaging people because that's people's lives because it the bottom is. line is, I wonder how these reporters would feel if people would do stories about them because everybody's got social media now. Yeah. Everybody's got enough platform to yeah. talk shit about them. and. Yeah. But there's many good reporters as well. There's people out there who love their job. There's many good coppers as well. But yeah. there just doesn't seem to be a level playing field. It feels as if if somebody's out to get you, they'll get you. Yeah. Especially in the UK. Yeah. There's fucking there's big power out there. You know this yourself. Like yeah. there's there is powerful people out there who can destroy you. And yeah. people do break and go back in their shell and don't want to fight anymore. So this is why it's important for you to be here today. Mm. You've got to stand up sometimes. You've got to fight back. Yeah. Because what you're gonna do just vegetate hide away and then potentially fucking take your own life yeah. for what because of yeah. way people treat you you've got to just i, I know stand. people will have their thing like oh social media you know you should have just deleted it when they told you to why you know why if that's something that i was enjoying doing i wasn't doing anything illegal anything corrupt i was enjoying my social media it was inspiring other people no one knew i was a cop until the point when someone went and told the media oh look at her what she's doing because they obviously clearly weren't getting what they wanted out of the internal reporting process so they thought oh, i'll just stick the knife in a little bit deeper you know yeah sad really but where do you go forward for the future leanne i'm just going to keep growing with my doing my fitness stuff with my brand and stuff like that i'm just gonna you know keep pushing try and be the light for other people <laughs> amongst everything that i've experienced i just want to help other people basically how big is in fit how big is fitness for you in the mental health um, it is the one thing that, I, because I know now that I'm back into streaming on Kick and I'm on there and I have to do, I do three workouts and two two chatting ones every week. You know, I can't, it gives me my structure. You know, I have to do it. I have to put my face on and I have to be this person. The fitness, it does release the happy hormones. I don't care what anyone says. You only regret the workout you didn't do. So if you get up and you actually do something with your day each day, it makes you feel as though you've achieved something, even though you just feel like, you know, closing the curtains, getting back in bed. And kids don't let you do that. But um, that's what you feel like doing, hiding away from the world. I think that and my fitness is what's pushed me to keep going. If I'm being completely honest with you, without that, I'm not sure where I'd be, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. What is all your social media, your OnlyFans and stuff? What is everything that people can maybe get involved in? I'll drop you a message or... Um, I'm the leeway across everything. So the, and then Lee, L-E-A-W-A-Y, the leeway. Um, and that's the same. I'm on all socials and obviously they've got the, the link on there as well for them to find all my platforms as well. So For anybody that's maybe watching that's went through what you're going through in the workforce and now like, the workplace, like, what advice would you have for them? Um, keep standing up for yourself. Don't back down. If you honestly hand, hand on heart feel as though something's not right, and you're not doing something wrong, then then keep going. Reach out to somebody who can be supportive. Don't try and do it alone like I have because that's what's nearly destroyed me. You know, seek some support from somebody else who's been through it or just somebody that you trust. It's all about trust because it can feel like a very dark, lonely place, but you've got to keep pushing. Stand up for yourself. Don't be treated like dirt. Um, the most important person in anybody's world is them and we have to look after ourselves because how can we look after anybody else if we're not looking after number one definitely listen leanne for coming on today and eventually saying your piece hopefully <laughs> it just makes you feel a wee bit lighter and then it's just a case of finish your year strong man like you've got a lot of big things happening for yourself so just stay positive and like you say it's just if you get any problems any issues it's good to just fucking talk it out never fucking bend a break for nobody ever because as soon as you do that then they've won and mm -hmm. then you then blame yourself yeah. And that's the worst of it. You've got to stand and fight at all costs. If you've not done anything wrong, if you believe you're in the right, don't cower away because mm -hmm. that then destroys you. And then as time goes, the mental health will go and get worse and get worse because you'll then think, why do people think that? Why are they saying that? This is the way the world works. People are always yeah. going to talk shit. People are always going to say shit. But the bottom line is you've got to stand back and fight and give your say. And people can make their own assumptions. People can judge. We all judge anyway. We're all judgmental bastards. Every single one is on this planet. But... There is good people out there. And again, listen, thanks for coming on Thank today. Thank you. Thanks I wish you all the me. best for the future. Take care and God Thank bless. Thank you.